You are listening to the Savage Fincast, episode 87, a shell of a lot of issues. Chicago. This is the Savage Fincast, the show that's a little green in the gills. My name is Jim Purcell. I'm Craig Olson. I'm Raven Perez. And uh, we got a very special, unique, green episode to get into. We don't have a new Savage Dragon issue uh, to review because they've been a little thin on the ground this year. Uh, We're intending, in the very near future, to do a retrospective on all the Savage Dragon going on for 2019. All uh, six issues. But we gotta do a little bit of catch-up. Because we have not been keeping up with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Urban Legend series like we had initially intended. Uh, too many interviews. Too many cool people to talk to. Getting not in the enough. way of the real content you're here for. Not enough dragon issues. Yeah, well that's the thing. Because uh, with, the, with the lack of dragon issues, we haven't been able to pair them up. Yep. Uh, so it's easier when your book was made 15 years... Uh, wait, what year is this? Uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> 25 years ago and all you gotta do is color it and reprint it they come out mm-hmm. on time when that happens yep like clockwork so we're gonna do a little bit of news segment just to catch us up for all the news for the end of the end of the year because it's uh the end end of november when we're recording this and we got some news we want, just want to make sure you know listeners have probably already heard but let you let you hear it again <laughs> uh and then we're gonna crank through urban legends 13 through 18 to get caught up it's going to be a beefy little episode. Yep, could be a little chunky. Just like I like my women. So, uh, <laughs> let's get into that news. <laughs> Take it away, Craig Olson. What are we starting with here? Savage Dragon number 250. Oh, crap. So, this is the big one, folks. Savage Dragon 250. They just released a solicitation copy... And a list of covers because you knew there were going to be variant covers with this. And so for two fifty, we have actually is it normal for there to be variant covers? I mean, uh, some of them there have been one or two, but this seems like a lot. I don't remember like issue one hundred having this many covers. Two twenty five did though. Yeah, two twenty five. Didn't have only, right? didn't have like three or two hundred did. I mean, oh. there was like the blank one, the Fosco one, two different Larson ones, right? I think Maybe so, less maybe. guess artists, but... Oh, that's right. He had two different trade dresses for, for 200 Something like that. Yeah. We'll but now we got 250 and we've got an amazing list of artists uh, that are contributing covers, which I am super stoked to check out. So, um, we got cover A, which is the Larson cover, which has been posted, and we saw that, and that's the callback to uh, the miniseries issue one cover, but now we've got Malcolm... Um, and now the additional cover is announced. We're going to get one by Frank Cho. Awesome. Rob Liefeld. Can't wait to see his take on it. It's been quite a long time since we've seen him draw a Savage Dragon. Uh, Walt Simonson, which is going to hopefully be amazing. Like one of my favorite artists. Yeah, dude, that's going to be uh, sick. <laughs> he did Dragon once as a pinup, right? Or he did in 100, he did a dragon backup, but Eric inked it. So I just want to see just like Walt Simonson, like alone. And then we're also getting a Scotty Young cover. And then on top of that, we're getting a blank cover, which we had gotten before, but it was with like the newer varsity letter Savage Dragon title. So now Mm -hmm. we're getting a new blank cover with like the original Savage Dragon title. So, uh, the comic's going to be a hundred pages. 10 bucks. So, for all you completists out there, when you add it up, it's 60 bucks if you want every cover. But come on, yeah. it's Savage Dragon. <laughs> come on, wait, wait. wait you're, what are you implying? That we should pay $60 for this? Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. I am. Yeah, show up. Uh, I am. I am <laughs> as someone who's anti variant, that, that is a weird uh, take to me. Show up. Why I'm, would I I'm want to spend $60 on one comic book when I could spend $60 on many comic books? <sighs> because here's the trick. You're only going to get a Savage Dragon 250 once. Then <laughs> it'll never happen again. 
it's not like Jim. It's not like with your corporate comics where they just poop out like the same shit. Say, for instance, Amazing Spider-Man 347 was to just show up years <laughs> later for no reason. I mean, that's not special, but Savage <laughs> Dragon 250, how many times in our lifetime are we going to get that? Once. Once. So buy it six times. Yeah. I'm doing it. I'm I am too. In. I am 100% <laughs> you guys, in. Sorry, guys. I can't agree with you on this one. It's okay. It's each his own. But so when you show up those who like it. When you show up at the convention, Jim, you're like, H -h -h Hello, Mr. Larson. It's me, <laughs> Jimmy, from the podcast. Jimmy. And he'll be like, Yeah, chomp, chomp on his cigar. I'll be like, I heard of you once. Kid. Yeah. Jimmy? Jimmy who? Little Jimmy Purcell. Good to see ya. And you'll be like, oh, geez, Mr. Larson, could you sign your name on my cover A of 250? And I'd be like, oh, of course. And then I'm like, hey, Eric, it's Raven. He's like, oh, Raven, you're so cool. And I'd be like, I know. Calm down. Anyway, could you draw on this sketch cover of 250? I bought all the covers, so I have this. <laughs> he'll be like, oh, no problem for you, anything. $600. Well, you yeah, know, whatever it takes. <laughs> I'm just saying, you want all Don't covers. Don't put this on eBay, kid. You want all covers. Now, let's say hypothetically, though. Jim, you're telling me you don't want that Walt Simonson cover? I mean... Which cover are you going to get? Who, me? Yeah, yeah you're you going to pick one. Always get the fucking interior artist cover. Okay. Rule okay. number one. Rule number two. <laughs> don't never buy wear the. Rule number three, never wear the band's t-shirt that you're going to go see in concert. Really? Is that a rule? Does yeah, it make, you never, does it make, does never it make, wear... The shirt of the band you're going to see. Does that make you look like a tourist? Kind of. Or a tool. So what if I wore Taylor Swift to a Wu-Tang Clan shirt? It's concert? fine. Totally fine. Yeah, you'd probably right. be a hero. Cool. All right. Now, if you wore a Taylor Swift shirt to a Taylor Swift concert, you'd still be a tool. They would tear you apart. But you'd apart. be a tool even if you didn't. All those girls, all those little girls just eat you alive. Just bones, blood and bones. Just because you wore the Taylor Swift shirt to the Taylor Swift show. <sighs> I'm learning so much on this FinCast. I just want to say... But I no, I, I, I'm pretty... I don't know, I, I don't like variant covers. Cause I, okay. cause for, the, for the exact reason, people will buy six copies of the same book, and I believe, deep down in my heart, that that harms the comic book industry. I get it, but I don't think that this harms the comic book industry. It's not like he does it every issue. Exactly. Like a certain Ninja Turtle comic. I, I think it. <laughs> I, I think it's a ploy to boost order numbers for most books. I think yeah, I think that's fine though for Savage Dragon. You know what? It's an anniversary issue. That's the only time he seems to really do them. Yeah. Let him make some dough. Plus, on top of that, um, uh, I am one hundred percent positive. That that Frank Cho and that Walt Simonson cover are going to just blow your goddamn balls off. I'm sure they're going to be great. I'm sure they'll be fine. I don't know. I'm not a Frank Cho fan. Although, I mean, tell although me he's not I a good artist, though. I mean, he's fine. It's not like his soul is on the cover of this issue. <laughs> it's his soul? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not saying, like, he doesn't matter. It's his art. It, like, I guarantee he will draw a great... Remember his pinup? The last yeah, the absolutely. last Cho pinup was way back in Savage World. Yeah, I guess, that was like the sign getting slammed into yeah. the. Yeah, that was great. And he's so much better now. He's like fucking he, got that. He weird... Actually, is a lot better now. <laughs> he's improved a lot. But he's always been awesome, though. He, honestly, he's, he's always been good, but he's better now. He like Raven's just like good. I said awesome, dude. Oh, well, he's awesome. He's awesome. All right, all right, cool. Now, question. Do you think Scotty Young's cover is going to tie into I Hate Fairyland? Or is it just going to be a cutie dragon cover? You know what? I think that will be the, one of the more interesting of the covers. Because it could go any direction. Although, I bet it will be about the kids. Ah, specifically. Ooh, very like he'll, smart. He'll do like a... Like a... Like the Does Calvin, Scotty like Young the Calvin only, and Hobbes thing. only draw like that cartoony style or does That's he it. draw more of a my i don't know quite enough about his career to comment i'm 90 percent sure that that is his house style which is fine i the earliest memory i have of him it was doing like a wizard of oz like series mm -hmm. and i'm pretty sure it looked the same 
are similar to his current like I hate uh, fairy I'm looking at stuff up and it looks like he did like a Deadpool stuff. I don't know, like oh. regular. Looking. I'm sure, like most artists, he has a range. He just kind of draws what he yeah. the way he likes. But I bet you're right, though. If he's doing his like little like cartoony style, it's probably gonna feature the kids on the cover. Yeah, that's just a thought that I had. I bet yeah. you you're right. Here's a real question. Oh wait, is he doing Middle West? No, he's writing Middle West. Okay, that explains. Here's that. a question. It's time to make a bet. How many characters will Liefeld put on the cover? I'm betting one. one. I'm betting two. One. Two and or one or two, but uh, now I'm cheating. But it's definitely going to be like pinup style, and it'll be dragon yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, original dragon, not even Malcolm. Yeah. <laughs> I bet. I bet you're be, right. Dude. No, come on. No, nope. and you won't be able to see his feet. <laughs> no, I'm not going to be shitty. Yeah, you know I'm saying, I'm saying, I bet it is Dragon. I bet it's original Dragon and not even Malcolm. No, I don't think so. I mean, come on. I mean, he's doing a cover to two fit. It's not like he's just doing some random issue. <laughs> it'll, just, it'll, just, it'll just be for two fifty. Oh, he's got to respect the material. I was going to say it would just be Bad Rock, but now I realize he doesn't own Bad Rock anymore. Oh, oh low blow. Oof. Sorry, well, sorry, Rob. Rob. <laughs> well, go ahead and finish off the solicitation, Craig. Uh, you know what? I think I want to pass the torch. I, I really enjoy hearing you, if you don't mind, <gasps> read yeah, the I solicitation. Could. I think the, the listeners prefer you to read all solicitations. <laughs> well, here we go. Eric Larson, Savage Dragon Hits Issue 250. For 28 years, Eric Larson has chronicled the lives and times of Dragon and his extended family in one of comics' only series set in real time. This monumental oversized milestone is a sweeping culmination that sets the stage for the next phase of comics' most uncompromising series with its most shocking story yet. Forces have conspired against Malcolm Dragon and his family, but is this the turning point or the end? Find out! As Savage Dragon becomes the second original image title to reach its 250th issue and begins the countdown to 300. So I'm pretty sure it's not the end because the countdown to 300 is started. What if it's the end, dude? I was what if it's the that. end for Malcolm? What if it's the end? Maybe Malcolm gets taken out and it just turns into like a book about the young kids. I'd be, or, I'd be down for that. Or... I was thinking about something. I was like, what would you guys think if he was just like pulled a fucking walking dead and was like, I just realized this was a good place to stop. Yeah. But again, I, I think Jim's right though. That last sentence begins the countdown to 300. Why would they bother putting that in? Could be a fake out walking dead had fake solicitations for their next upcoming whatever's. What would you guys think if Savage Dragon 250 was the last issue of, two, of Savage Dragon? I'd be very sad. I, my sadness would be overwhelming. Yeah, I'd be fucking shook the fuck up. I would sure. be bummed. I would probably this has like been with... one of the the only constants in my life for like how many other year. You know what I mean? Like whatever happens and like like look at the past twenty years. Like there's always Savage Dragon. There's always an issue of Savage Dragon. How many things are out there like that? You know, Savage Dragon is your rock. Well, I was hoping, I hope that's not what it is. But I was thinking that. I was thinking to myself, I was like, wouldn't that just fucking flip everyone the fuck out? If he was just like, meh. Because, I mean, you know he's only doing it because he just loves it. At least we'd have another 170-something retro fin cast we could do. <laughs> yes, we could fill that time. <laughs> just keep the torch going, you know? <laughs> oh, Lord. Please let it not be so. I'm excited for this issue, though. Oh, and it yeah. sounds like there's going to be a big quo change. Like, I don't know. Every issue solicitation reads like this these days. He's always so vague. Know, he's, always, he's always so vague about it because he's always making it up as he goes. He's he's making, for my observation, he's basically making covers and then filling the story in behind it most of the time. Yeah, but I feel like with his anniversary issues, he always makes some major issue happen. Like there's like when you look at like the fifties, a hundreds, 
Well, the round, try, those, those num- the anniversary issues, my always is something as, major my happens. My memory's not as good as it used to be, or ever, but I remember issue 200 not being a massive change. Are you sure? Because that was, kind of... that was the issue where Dra- uh, Malcolm, Angel, and Average Dragon just kind of teamed up for a fight, right? No, 225 was where Average Dragon died. No, 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 I'm not talking about when he died. I'm oh. talking about when they just kind of had, like, a barroom brawl. Yeah. I, I feel like there was no major, like, status change that issue. Maybe not. Was that when it started getting more sexy? No, that didn't happen for a little while. That might have, but there were other ones where, you know, definitely, like, Drag, everyone thought Dragon died and he became, like, William Dragon on one. Yeah, that know, was, was that was like, issue 15. Um, 100, where the complete universe was destroyed. Uh, ye- issue 100, uh, wait, was no, the universe wasn't destroyed in 100. The universe wasn't destroyed in 75, 75. Oh, sorry. right, right, 75, yes, for sure. 100's big thing was that he stayed in the Savage World. That was yeah. the big status quo change, because he had been fighting to get home, and then he decided to stay. Man. Oof. I don't know. All I know is it's going to be good. I'm excited. I oh, yeah. I, I, I feel it's going to be... It's going to be awesome. The hype is... I'm in the grip of the hype already. But I... I don't know. These days, I just kind of take it as it comes. Uh, I like to speculate, but this is a hard series to speculate about sometimes. Because it, do, <laughs> it, it, it does sometimes feel like stream of consciousness mm-hmm. from Eric. And so I feel like it's almost impossible to predict what he's going to do next. Because it isn't like he's got this... I mean, he's probably got a plan, but he doesn't have a like a grand intric- intricate plan. Mm-hmm. So, right. if he doesn't have a plan, God help you trying to predict anything. <laughs> I think he's got like a big outline. Like it's not may issue every issue isn't planned, but I think he's got an overarching kind of broad strokes. I mean, we've talked to him in interviews, and I just don't get that sense anymore. No, I, I really do. at times I don't. But I gotta imagine that he's got something planned that he knows of at this point for two fifty. Yeah, I think he knows oh. what's happening in two fifty. Yeah, I'm sure he probably knows like the major like event in two fifty. How he gets there, that's another question. Anyway. Lots of crazy shit in play. So what do we got next for uh, news? Uh we got well, to tie in with uh, this episode's topic, uh, Frank Fosco has revealed the cover to Nin- uh, Ninja Turtles Urban Legends number 24. Uh, this is the first issue that will contain new material, not previously published at Image. Because the Image issues ended at 23, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, Correct. and incomplete. So he will. this is the start of the three-issue conclusion that was the entire point of republishing the series. Which is pretty awesome. It's pretty pretty, pretty awesome that again the chance not that doesn't always happen. No. It, How many it's years highly has it been? unusual actually. I'm uh, really happy for Frank and Gary because I think it's cool as shit that they got to conclude this because I've really been enjoying it. At first yeah. I was like lu- more lukewarm waiting for the dragon stuff to happen. But then, as we got more into it, and I started to like fall into the narrative of what like the turtles themselves were just doing, it it, it got me. You know, I'm into it like you know big time. So it's cool as shit that they got to finish this and put it in color for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Although I really hope that IDW does the old double dip and prints it in black and white too. Mm. I'd love it. That would I don't be think awesome. They will, but I. I don't think it's the kind of thing IDW does. They're like allergic to black and white in my experience. You know, they just took Weird. over they just took over publishing Usagi Ujimbo and like they they're planning to reprint it all in color. Like the ghost of Ted Turner works at IDW. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> colorizing everything. Yeah, I just got to color. Oh, gotta right, 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 cuz okay, was he one of the ones who was doing that to the movies? Oh, uh, yeah, it was him, TBS. He had the whole, I see. He was, Colorizing shit look shit look like a pastel nightmare. Jesus. 
Well, I'm very excited, and the cover is cool. It has Pimico and all the turtles on it, so that's neat. And Frank has been doing new, like, alternate covers for the reprints, but this is right. his first, like, new, new cover. So, no, all the alternates are new covers. Well, that's what I said. The, the oh. Well, no, the A co- Frank's been doing the A. This is the first, like, brand new issue cover. Right. That's what I said. Oh, all right. Play the tape back. Well, <laughs> you you s- don't get crazy here. <laughs> well, just to be clear, he's been doing new covers, which are the A covers. The B covers, the variant covers, are the reprinted covers from the previous run. Right. And then there's uh, so he's making, he's he's doing ma- his he's own ma- covers, too. Oh, he is? Yeah. I didn't know those were there. I never even saw yeah, those. Kevin Eastman. So you you read the digital version, right? I do. On the hard copy is the inside cover. Shows, Maybe the digital has no, it, No, it too. doesn't. They're blank. It's blank. There's a big empty space. It's very annoying. Really? You, yeah. So it doesn't give you, like, the credits or the story so far? It, it gives me the credits, the story so far, and a big empty space where there's what? obviously supposed to be cover previews. How weird. It is very yeah. strange. I don't like it. Yeah, the hard co- the the hard copies have all three covers on the inside yeah, it, front cover. I don't know why they do it. I think I think it's incentive to make you buy print, and which means fuck you. That's a really so, dumb incentive. Like you're gonna see that little white square yeah. and just be like, "Oh my god, I need to buy this." <laughs> the um the Kevin Eastman covers are retailer incentive covers. So cover A and B, yeah, you can just order as much as you want, and then the Eastman are retailer covers, but. There, um, Kevin Eastman's been killing it on some of these covers. I, yeah. I really enjoy his his takes. It's yeah. neat to see him because he's actually he's not just doing pinups of turtles or anything like that. He's actually putting like each issue's like story elements and in, in, in incorporating it into the cover. Well, that's yeah, certainly cool. cool. Yeah, so like cool. for for issue twelve, like he has his his cover is like them staring out the window of Vanguard's ship. Which is pretty cool, but you things to, like that you get to are, see him like drawing Raff in the Shredder armor and shit. Like it's cool, man. Yeah. Um, speaking of Kevin Eastman, there's a on Netflix. There's a TV. Sh- there's a show about uh, the toys that made us. Oh yeah. yeah. And there was an episode in the current season about Ninja Turtle action figures. Oh, I gotta watch that. So there's a very cool interview segment between with, with Peter Laird. And Kevin Eastman about their experiences creating the turtles. Mm-hmm. Did they have Stan Leroy's leaping lizards? <laughs> no, 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 they did, they they did not unfortunately talk about that particular toy line and Jim Lee's involvement. <laughs> of course not. Why would you? Uh, but it, it was fascinating, and the situation with Kevin Eastman with the with the sale of Viacom because Kevin uh, Kevin Eastman sold his stake in Turtles to Larid years prior. Okay. And so when Laird yeah. sold the Viacom, Eastman got nothing from the sale. Oh, makes but, sense. But when the when the IDW series happened, everyone went to Eastman for consultation, and then that's why he's been involved so heavily in the IDW stuff. Is that because they've been paying him to do it, be the cons- the primary consultant? Uh, but he still must have got paid from Laird because. Ninja Turtles are already like that's not what the uh, interview said. What? Yeah, because he sold his stake, Laird. Yeah, but but his stake was worth so much when he sold it. It had to be. Oh, it's Ninja well, Turtles. Oh, yeah, he made money when he sold it, but not as much money as Vi- that Laird. Did no, Vi- but I'm just saying. Laird, it's still... Laird sold it. Uh, Laird sold the Viacom for like sixty one million dollars. But I gotta imagine that East he bought Eastman's stake for for millions as well. well maybe, maybe not me, sixty one, two, two but... or three or four. Really, that's it. And and then of course when Viacom had the rights, apparently one of their first fiscal years they made like three hundred plus thousand million dollars in Turtles merch wow. sales and TV shows and such. I can't believe that's all that. I don't know. It seems like it, that'd be. And and Laird continues to retain the rights to self published Turtle comics if he ever so desires. Wow, that's Which is fucking actually awesome. pretty cool when you think about you know corporations being monsters. That's that's an amazing deal because you can just be like, ah, I just want to make my own series, yep. and no one can stop him. Well, <laughs> and then I can be like, oh, the other series is fake. This is the real shit. That's fucking bananas, dude. I'm pretty sure in the contract it says that's the one thing you can't do. They say this is real. That's fake. <laughs> yeah, but you can just hint it. Yeah. I mean, and everyone would be on. Board. I mean, to be fair, it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it would be like what's coming from Nickelodeon is not the same yeah, as a, what's coming from the creator. Right? So. Imagine like Eric Larson sells Dragon has the same deal, and it's like 
I'm going to keep you making Dragon Comics. You know, be on Twitter and be like, you could read Company A's, but if you want to read real dry, you know, like, you want to read my shit, that's the shit that counts. You know what's funny? Remember when fucking Eric bought Ant? Yeah, and, like, yeah. for just a hot minute, Mario Gully was mad, and Mario made Bug. <laughs> I remember that. And it was just ant with like brown and like the word <laughs> bug spelled with two G's. I'm just saying that's exactly what it would be like. It's like, no, <laughs> you, can't. you can't. You just can't do that. The savage lizard. <laughs> oh, Lord, dude. No. All right. Do uh, we, we got any more mail or? Uh, mail, no. Uh, I'm not mail. I'm sorry. News. Oh, you know what? I never actually checked. Hold on. Let me check the. The last piece of news while you're looking for that. Is Amazing Spider-Man 347 is getting reprinted in January 2020. For Larson fans and aficionados, it is a must-own reprint. The house ads will be included. Uh, it will be a facsimile exactly. They're not going to stuff it full of new shit. So it's kind of cool if you want that little time capsule moment. It's so, got yeah. the Alas, Poor Spider-Man, I Killed Him Well cover. Right. You Venom holding the skull like Cedric. You know what's... York, wow. not Cedric. Yeah, right. It's it, Yurik. Yeah. Yep. You know what's weird though? You know well. What's weird? You can buy a digital copy of that book right now for two dollars, and when this comes out, you can have the privilege of paying four dollars for it instead. Well, that's what I don't understand either. Why is it four bucks? Because that's how much comics cost to print. But yes, no, because they're reprinting all their old shit for like a dollar a piece. Oh, you mean you mean Marvel? Uh, the Marvel First or the yeah? Well, they're different. I'm pretty sure most of that cost is relicensing the ads, because I don't suspect that's cheap. Because you really, I I don't I I don't know how they do it, how they get away with it, I dude. Because like all those true believer issues, like Bullseye Number One, or but no, I don't know, none of, none, they... none of those have the old house ads. So they all, I mean, the old uh, um, actual ads, yeah, ad ads. But it's not like they're paying the artists any more. They've already got yeah. all that shit. It I should be know. cheap, Whatever. I agree. Yeah. Whatever. I don't know the the actual numbers, but I bet they're, it's because they got to pay Snickers. That's weird. Hey, you know, speaking of, are, as fo- you think Fosco and, and Gary are uh, getting paid anything for these reprints or I, just for the new stuff? You know what? We can't really speculate about that because we don't know. I'm sure Gary's well, getting, I'm saying. getting I don't paid know. for his covers, I'm sure, and... Not Gary. What am I saying? Frank is getting paid be, for his covers. You know, we're allowed to say what we think. They should be. Right. I'm not saying. I don't know. Uh, they're likely I'm, just, I'm not, wondering if they get a cut of anything. I doubt they they got any uh, uh, residuals, uh, to be honest. Because that's another thing. They're getting like four bucks for a book that basically, well, I mean, it's got to be recolored, but. The coloring. The, that's about the, it. The, the new printing. Well, coloring is expensive. I mean, it's it going to run you about 2000 a book. Yeah. So. I mean, it's not cheap to color a book. So, I mean, 2000s low, I think, well, yes, too. You would think that these books would be cheaper because the bulk of the work is done. But you'd be fucking well, wrong. I guess, you know what, though? If it helps, $4 ensures that we get to see the conclusion. Yeah. Then, all right. Whatever. I mean, there's that, too. Because, yeah, you could be banking the money to pay the... Because I assume Gary will be getting, getting paid for writing the last three issues he's writing. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm sure they don't do it for free. Yeah. So. Well, plus two, um, it is uh, cool just to have these made available. So to a small yeah, extent, absolutely. I mean, these are hard to get. So to a small extent, it's kind of like the little bit of like the um, you're paying just for the fact that this is a hard to get item these days. You know what right. I mean? Right. Right. But I think it's really more that comic books cost four dollars, so you're going to pay four dollars for this comic, so we can make a little bit more profit on this book, so that we can. Spend a little bit more money on the next book that isn't all reprints. Basically, it's it's a way to... Because, like, why do graphic novels cost $30 when it's all reprints? It's because it's profit. It's all it really boils down to. It's just getting more more profit out of your, your back catalog. Yeah. Well... No, I get it. It's business. It's business. You can't see me. I'm rubbing my <laughs> fingers together. <laughs> For the listeners at home, Jim had his fingers rubbed together. <laughs> so shall we, we uh, jump into the meeting? The, uh, as long meeting as we cheese? didn't get any mail. Wah, nope. Wah. nope. Nobody loves us. The meat and cheese and pizza sauce? 
So issue 13 is the last issue, well, is the only issue that we're going to be re- uh, covering tonight that has Vanguard in it. Can we can we just do, because I guess, you know, it's been a while since we talked about Turtles. You know, we've been doing it during the regular FinCast episodes. You want to do a quick recap? Regular, I mean, by the, the current issues, not the retro issues. Can we do just a little recap of like the kind of the three storylines going on currently? Okay. Like we got the the mob storyline, the mob foot we clan storyline. Yes. The, uh, yeah. So, what's the background on that? Just uh, for the listeners. Well, it's a little convoluted because it's partly about trying to kidnap uh, Casey Jones' kid Shadow because this biological uh, father was. Uh, so it's the Puzzarelli mob, right? Or yeah. whatever is that what they call him? Yes. Yeah. So. So the the boss is what he's the father. He, he, his his son impregnated Casey Jones' girlfriend before Casey Jones was dating her. Yes, right. The she daughter, had a kid. Shadow is like the a mob a mob guy's kid. So he's trying. But the mob guy wanted nothing to do with the kid, right? Right. The grand, but the the father did, I guess, because he needs an heir. The grandfather. Yeah. Right. And the the mother. That was dating Casey Jones died in like what the previous Mirage series? Uh, yeah, I think that was a uh, yes. Yep, you're correct. So Casey Jones has kind of like custody and treats Shadow as his own daughter. Yes, right. And now the mob in the beginning of this Urban Legends, the mob went after and kidnapped Shadow. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember the turtles like intervened, right? Turtles intervened. The foot they hired the foot to capture the, the daughter. No, they did, or they just the did foot, it themselves. The foot. I'm trying to remember exactly because it has been a while. But the foot and Raphael came to an understanding that Raphael had to kill somebody, but I can't remember who he was supposed to kill. Mm-hmm. But he he saved Shadow, but he brought a. a, a Whatever the circumstances, he made were. a deal with the foot, and now the mob is like pissed at the foot, right? Right, and but he, but Raf also uh, messed up the deal, so the foot was also pissed at Raf. Right, and at the time of this issue thirteen, well, issue twelve just happened, right? And the mob came in and wiped out like a bunch of the foot guys. Yes, yeah, like the they foot were shooting them up. And so where we stand on 13 is the aftermath of that. And right. remember, too, that the foot, actually, I think Raph killed Shredder in a Mirage title. And so uh, the foot is actually without a leader at the moment. And, okay. And so that's why it was such a big deal, because the, there were just three ninjas that were kind of like head ninjas that were just sort of like keeping the foot together. And that's why the Turtles and Raph had a like a little treaty because like they were like, well, you know, we, I mean, we fucking killed Shredder. He was the asshole. Like, we, you know, the foot will just leave you guys alone as long as you leave us alone. Yeah. And so that was kind of the truce. Okay. So that's where we stand on that. Then the second storyline going on is this Death Watch character. Right. Who's like also like a, he's like an alien hybrid. He's like there's the serial killer Johnny Lee Rayburn. Okay. Who was like part of a weird science program where they were sending inmates on kind of like almost suicide space missions. But he came back and he was fused with Death Watch. So you've got like a serial killer slash alien hybrid. in Some alien symbiote fused with him and came back to Earth. Right. And And so now, last issue, he was back on Earth and and whereas Raphael was dealing with the Foot Clan and the mob shit, all the rest of the turtles were... With Vanguard searching for Rayburn Death was go- Watch. Rayburn was going around killing people that led him. Death Watch was going around killing people that led to him being killed. And the gotcha. Turtles and Dragon busted his shit up in Chicago, and uh, he took off. And they tried to track him to that one little town. That's in like Arkansas, 13. right? Where he was from, right? Right. Okay. And, and then that's the, where thirteen starts. They're they're in Arkansas, right? They're trying to and find. We'll get Rayburn. through that when we get to thirteen. Right. And then the third storyline that's kind of been hanging around is that when Splinter was injected with the synthetic mutagen from the Komodo guy, right? It turned him into like a bat creature, correct? And so he's still kind of flying around out there. Yeah, he's rabid. He's out of his mind because the bat had rabies. 
Gotcha. So that's where we stand. And there's also at the end of twelve fourth right? kind of ongoing storyline involving Donatello in his armor. Uh, right. Although that's sort of tied in with this story, it is kind of a separate story that will gotcha. feature heavily in these next few issues, where they think that Donatello is dead, and it's just the kind of cybernetic robot part that's alive, right? Right. Yeah, Rayburn Rayburn told him, he's like, well, I killed him. And the armor is telling him, the like, whole time the armor's like, no, you know, your brother's dead. And he's like... He, he's, There's no signs of life, right? Yeah, like, I'm just a symbiote, like, on your brother, but your brother's gone. Okay. And so that's where we open on 13. Yep. Yep. So when 13 opens, the, the boys are there in April, and uh, the boys in April are trying no, not, to hunt not him a- down... Not April. Not April, shit. Vanguard. Yeah. <laughs> and and his little woman. Roxanne. Roxanne. <laughs> Who is also a, re- also a reporter. So, yes, easy <laughs> easy confusion. Well, I, I love this scene. I would just say that, like, so I told you, like, I came around. Like, I was originally only really into this for the dragon elements. Mm-hmm. And then I really could have come around. I Like, I think Gary and Frank did a really good job on this series, just with cool moments. And this scene where they're in the diner and, like, all the people are dead, that's creepy as shit. Yeah. Like, this is a really cool scene. Uh, one thing I want to add is, since we went through all these little plots going on, this is some of the stuff that I miss that Savage Dragon used to do, it's, where he had it, four plot lines yep. all it's, kind of hanging around. I love that. It's way denser than things are now. Yep. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And in some ways, it's actually a little bit too much, because there's a lot going on in this series. Dude, it is dense as hell, but I still like it. I just like how everything's kind of get getting connected and moving and flowing, and people come out of the the comic and then they come back in four issues later, and I I just enjoy that. It always just feels like rapid and something's happening. Yeah, I do think. Here's what's so weird is like okay, like this is like a little side tangent, but it's kind of like I feel like. Um, like, again, we were talking about, like, I think I said this last uh, FinCast, but, like, Dragon is kind of right now, like, we we say, like, Dragon has eras, like, the family-friendly era, the, like, naughty era, the Savage World era, you know, and I swear to you, I think that, like, Dragon's era right now is the standalone issue era. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I swear to you, that's the direction. Like, that's where he's... I, yeah, I absolutely know it. he's doing it on purpose. He's, he's talked about it. Emphasizing that over everything. And so I, I, know, I get it that, like, you know, it's completely, they are totally at odds. Like, if you're trying to make each issue, like, standalone and you're trying to weave all these threads, like, you could never just pick up one of these Turtles issues and just, yeah. be, and just be okay. And, and I'll be, be honest, There's I, no one I picked those. up a few random issues of these in the past, and I could not penetrate them. And I'm pretty good at starting stuff in the middle. Yeah, so it's yeah. I, I get it where they're totally at odds with each other. That being said... I do like when Savage Dragon's juggling a lot of plot threads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. So uh yeah, we get this uh spooky cafe scene. That's a great scene. This is so good. Uh where you know Malcolm of uh, Malcolm, uh Vanguard and Roxanne are just kinda <laughs> just documenting what's been going on. Because I guess Death Watch has just been draining people of their life force. Right. Uh this whole town is basically fucking dead. Yeah, <laughs> he killed a whole town, dude. It's awesome. This outfit Roxanne's wearing. I know, dude. I like it. <laughs> is unique. It's tight. <laughs> she's like a Mortal Kombat character. She is. Yes, yeah, so she's exactly. She's a uh, uh, Sonya Son- Son- Blade. Yeah. It's great, dude. But uh, then we cut back to New York, where the uh, the mob guys have already murdered the uh, Foot Clan uh, leadership. And so this is where it gets dark. Yeah, oh yeah. Is, this well, this, this, this is a dark this, scene. This is where you learn why comic turtles are the best turtles. <laughs> yeah, they are, dude. And by the way, he's talking about like the the like the uh, Eastman cover is like so sweet and badass because it's got like Raph like with the arrows. Like he yeah, definitely jumping through the air. It's, it's like that same scene. Oh yeah, this, yeah I and, love that. This, and we're this, talking about like this is the story of Raphael murdering forty seven guys. Hell yeah, dude. And, like, the moment where he shoots the arrow down the barrel of the gun. Oh, it's so cool. And then he just starts blasting them up. I'm I'm with it, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and it's crazy because he's, like, 
He's like, I'm gonna have to get one of these babies for myself. I'm like, dude, ninja. He's like, this gun. is murder. <laughs> yeah, he, he loves it, dude. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, but it's cool. I mean, they're ninjas. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but this, I like that. This is why you don't rely on the gun though, because it runs out of bullets. The the blade, you don't need to reload. And I want to say that the colors on this are phenomenal. Like when you flip the page and like the way he's got the whole like uh, magenta sky behind the kind of like Rayburn's family ancestral house. And it's yeah. like a, and they literally like, it's funny, Gary literally mentioned Psycho like right there. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, you're, so you're getting all the vibes, but like just the coloring on this was. Mm. That's our boy, Adam Guzowski. Hell Is that yeah. how you say it? Shout out to Adam. Yeah. We know he listens. Yeah. But... Fantastic job. Yeah, it really. I mean, from going from a black and white comic to like turning it, it it turns into something completely different in color. Honestly, I mean, I like them both, but color definitely changes the comic. I mean, I guess that sounds pretty obvious, but no, 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 no I get it because because these these pages in particular with the with the um, how do I phrase this the um, the house page with a mm-hmm. you see. Um, Michelangelo is in shadow mm-hmm. with the tree. So in black yeah. and white, that's going to look way starker yeah. than it would be with color fills. But it, even like the moods, so like if you're, you know, and I guess for the listeners, if you guys are following along, the page where Raphael is shooting up everybody. Right. I mean, an amateur colorist would just color like normal colors, you know? Yeah. The walls this color, guys this color. But to take like that middle panel where he's blasting all those guys and just give it a red hue, yeah, dude. which just gives you that like oh like death, the kind of like or danger, like it just gives you mood and it it just it works great. Right. All the scene where he's on that same page where he's in like the purple smoke, the gun is done. He's just it's just clicking away. Um, I mean, black and white also gives you those stark kind of images, and but you know. If you're going to put it in color and you want to still retain some of that mood that the black and white gives you, like, I think he did a, a great job kind of giving those kind of color lenses and, you know, the, the different mood kind of set colors, like the reds and the purples. Um, totally 100% agree. Um, uh, just like wanted to say too, like, I love like, there's, all right, so it's kind of funny to say this is going to not sound like maybe 100% of a compliment, but I just love, like, the things that happen. Like, you're talking about, like, dense, like, event-heavy, like, just kind of mm-hmm. like Gary, like, puts kind of, like, crazy moments in here. Like, think Rayburn killed his whole town, but on top of that, they, like, go into, like, the house and, like, he killed his own mom yeah. <laughs> for testifying against him in trial. I love it, dude. So it's just, it was a crazy movie. It's super creepy, too. It's like, you know, it's almost like a horror movie. You got the old lady in the chair. Yeah. It's so and good. then this creepy Death Watch guy. I love, like, even with the colors of, like, the glowing eyes in the dark. Mm hmm. Good stuff. It's good, dude. And then we get a little cyborg fight action. That's pretty sweet. Circular saw action type stuff from Donatello's suit or robotic appendage or whatever yeah Real body dawn and the love like uh it's almost, he's only he's super patriot-esque with his transforming limbs yeah super patriot yeah i thought the scene so so after you know this thing this book's bumping back and forth between uh raphael's scene and the rest of the turtles and death watch and the scene where you know you got raphael you get that brutal like just sticking his side right through the guy <laughs> yeah uh, that's awesome but i thought that they really missed the mark on what what they could have done with the shredder costume so there's one scene where raphael leans up against the wall and he you know basically discovers shredder's inter inner sanctum yep right and I thought, you know, they almost could have went by the kind of Eric Larson school of layouts where you, you know, instead of having that big reveal on the left page, oh. it should have been a full splash, almost like mm. Fosco's cover. Which which page is it on? It's on, uh, so on the, it's on the left side where, oh. where, um, Raph like flicks the match and sees the, the costume. Right. 
and then on the right page he kicks it over. But man, how much better would have it worked if that was on like a full page splash on the that right? Him back seems up. like a mistake. That seems like somebody didn't think out the layout. Right. right well, that's time. what I'm saying. It would have been so much better to see like almost like Fosco's cover as a splash where like he backs up into like although, the suit and turns around and freaks out. Although it could be a case of they wanted to show you the armor when you turn the page. No, but that's what Craig's saying is that like it would have been better served as a splash. Like instead And then you, you turn to, the page and find out it's not really Shredder. Like you get three page you get three little panels of him flicking a match. You could have cut those like flicking the match out. And just had it like you flip the page and it's like there's the shredder armor. Uh, like, oh, yeah. shredder, yeah. But whatever. I mean, still kind of a cool idea. Shredder's inner sanctum is cool. I mean, that's a sweet double page spread where you get to see like him, like he makes his own armor. Like, and it really kind of works to help sell the idea of Shredder as a badass. Yeah. And it is cool to see all the different Shredder armors. I think one of these is even, some of these might be, like, directly from other things. Like, well, I think, the, the like, purple one looks like it's from the movies. Yeah, I was yeah. going to hey. say. Well, I'm pretty sure that, that like, you know, the armor, uh, the, like, more red one is, like, Super Shredder. Yeah. Kind of, from the movies. So, it's cool to see all these different Shredder armors. And to sort of have the like lore that he makes his own shit, right? Um, so we cut back. How many? Hmm? <coughs> God, I was, sorry. I was gonna say we we're gonna cut back to the Death Watch battle, but what were you gonna say? I was gonna say how many times can uh, Lurch uh, kind of pull that same trick where you, you think it's one guy and it's really Lurch. Well, I mean, that, that thing, it seems to be a little overused. When, but... I, when a character st- stops talking, it's a good good indicator. <laughs> <laughs> That's also literally his whole gimmick. <laughs> yeah. Like, like literally Lurch's whole thing is like, oh, you think it's me? Psych, it's Lurch. <laughs> Rayburn gets away, bros. He does. Very it's, disappointed. It's shocking. And he messed up Donatello. Oh yeah, he basically. Uh, we'll find out later, but yeah, he gets bad. He gets it bad. And double dead. Yeah, exactly. And then you know, like this whole scene of Shredder is like fucking badass. Like, or wait, yeah, like that's Raphael the next in issue. the Shredder costume. No, no, no there's, there's, there's some more here. Yeah, just a little bit. Beats the crap out of some mobsters. Knocks a guy's tooth out. Too bad. Slice. Swish slice. Yep, we end on the cliffhanger of uh, Raphael in the Shredder armor, which, which is a pretty which badass is concept. Pretty cool. Yep, you got to admit. It. This whole series, uh, Raph's all about playing dress up. I mean, he's like Casey Jones in one issue and Shredder now. <laughs> Raph's into playing dress up. You just made it lame. <laughs> Sorry, you you lamed it up. It was cool, but you made him seem dorky for doing it. <laughs> No, nah, it's very cool. Um, I'm I'm fucking super into it. I think this is like of all the things that are happening in this, I think Raph like and what a what a funny like kind of a logical progression, you know? Yeah. Dude, uh, and then issue fourteen again, the Eastman cover is badass with like the Shredder Raph. Yes, dude. <laughs> oh, I think the new Fosco cover is great too because it's also got yeah, Shredder absolutely. Raph. And it's interesting, <laughs> excuse me, if you look at the old um, Larson Fosco cover, um, Raph is buried in uh, Shadow. Yeah. And so it's kind of mm-hmm. cool because it's kind of like, oh, you can see like they kept that like more like sort of, I wonder in black and white like how hard it was to tell like if that was the Shredder or what, like you know what I mean? Yeah, because you don't see like, the green. Yeah, like it's not really obvious that that's not Shredder fighting Splinter on the cover of that issue so that's kind of yeah absolutely oh good 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 point about that because yeah if it would have been solicited in advance people would say oh shredder versus splinter right so now we get to just pretty much see an absolutely you're talking about like cool coloring and like just bloody and like that double page spread Mm -hmm. of of, uh raphael just slicing the shit out of people yeah yeah shredder raf it's sweet 
It's sweet as hell. Yeah, I don't. I feel like there's not that many like double page splashes in this series, unless I'm just not noticing. Uh, I think, I think you're, you're right. right. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, you're right. Cool. There's not that many. It's a cool That's visual. Cool. Yeah, and and it's colored great. I like it. Just using the limited color palette with the reds. Again, just setting the mood, you know, like just coloring all the characters red just gives you that sense of violence or danger. I think it's got like this whole sequence, like, like everything, like, you know, Adam was like figuring it out maybe in the very earliest, but like, man, he's got it, dude. Like with like the zip tone dots, like the mm-hmm. white zip tone dots look great in this like, you know, sequence here. And then he's like stained the, uh. He stained the, like, Shredder gauntlets with blood. Like, oh, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a cool sequence. Like, uh, you know, the foot, they come and they sort of confront uh, Raph about, like, you know, what he's doing. And he's like, uh, nah, get up, you know, dopies. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're... Hey, basically, what, good chastise him. Like, you know, you guys just ran away and I took care of business, so basically deal with it and they eventually just take him on as a leader well, not eventually he murders a guy for standing you know calling him out for stealing the armor yeah so he's 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 right away he's uh, establishing who's in charge here says they don't is have it... any on they don't have any honor yeah he, he he talks shit to him it's great the way he points it out he's like you know when the mobsters were there these assholes were gone and now that like it's just him they're all like teaming up and that's why he takes that dude out because he's just got to like put those other fools in line. It's still life or death. Like it's justified homicide. <laughs> that funny scene where the guy's just playing fetch with his dog and fucking <laughs> bat splinter just snatches it up and eats it. Yeah, that's talking about like like I said when you're like talking about like just cool, funny, weird moments in this series. Like that's just a great like little two page sequence to show. The Splinter's out there, and he's still fucking berserk. Yep. Yep. And we get to see Van and the Turtles and Roxanne. Oh, yeah, there was more Vanguard in here. Um, I actually yeah. forgot. Just a little bit. This is where they realize Donatello got jacked up by Death Watch. Yeah. And this scene is a little weird and funny, and I, don't, I was like, I was a little scratching my head a little bit about it, but basically the, the cyborg part of Donatello separates. Mm-hmm. And joins up with Lurch, right? Yep. Yeah. He integrates in with Lurch, who's also an artificial And then turns being. into this, like, Jack Kirby robot thing. Yeah. <laughs> it it's, flies it's the, away. It's the Seeker. Yeah. <laughs> then it flies away, and Donatello is, like, still dying and still got, like, kind of mech. So I remember, like, first reading this and thinking, oh, that's how they solve, like, Donatello. He's going to be back to normal again, and... You know, the the robot shit just kind of flew away. But that's not really the case. No, No, it's a fake out. Donatello's still dead. It's just he still has some of the replacement parts that the cyborg built into him. Yeah, he still has the cyborg parts on him, so he's not, like, completely cleaned off of it. No. And so Van's like, I'm going to put you on life support, like, up in my ship, so... It is kind of strange that both Death Watch and uh, and the cyborg armor both basically run away and are gone because yeah. uh, they don't come back for the next few issues well the cyborg right. armor is like just it's acting true to form I mean they're both doing true to form things here like Ray Burns out carrying out his little like revenge mission still he's still like out for revenge right so it makes sense that he just like teleports away or whatever the hell wait where, but, what's he need revenge against um anybody that helped put Rayburn uh into his little like suicide program, basically, who the people oh. who testified against him in the murder oh. trial. Oh no, yeah, Death Watch. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. He would still escape. Yeah. So it makes sense there, but then the uh, cyborg is also kind of acting because remember, it's not just a cyborg; it's like a parasite. Right. Like it that's how it got on. Th- right, and th- there's actually a scene where like it's trying to. Yeah, exactly. It's trying to find a host, and it tries to get onto. I don't know which turtle I'm looking at here. But, like, yeah, it tries to get on one of the turtles and, and can't. Yeah. Because, like, you know, he gets whacked by <laughs> kind of weird. Seems like Leo hits him in the hand with a katana. I'm not yeah. quite sure here. Yeah, I thought, because I know a, a turtle loses his hand, I thought this was how a character lost his hand. But I guess he was 
just hit it just right to to break the link. Right. Right. But then Lurch is the one that ends up getting like the parasite. So Yeah. This must not be the same Lurch. Unless there's a story beat that we haven't gotten to yet. Cause it's this what same lurch as what the vanguard the, the van, backups the, the, the and van, yeah, yeah the it's van, the same lurch oh well then they'll probably they, there must be more of this later yeah i would imagine because later there on is. we know lurch later on gets like sentience right yep so like you know without anything in turtles we know that lurch gets rid of that symbiote at some point and if i mean and death watch reappears back in the, the savage dragon backs backups too so oh i forgot he did yep it all ties in, like all this Ninja Turtle stuff, all later in ties into the Vanguard backups and Dragon. That's why, I like, this series is like so closely related to Dragon. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, it is. Not only, not only does it have like the Dragon appearances, but down the road, you know, because Frank and Gary wrote it, it ties in, and they they were able to revisit a lot of these characters in the Vanguard backups. It's cool, man. Like, as someone who largely missed this stuff the first time, like, I'm I'm really glad that, like, I'm getting into it now. Like, it, it is cool. Even though, like, the dragon stuff is in there less than I had thought, it still, like, ties in really well, like, in cool ways. I like it. Right. Yeah. I'm pleased. But uh, here we basically get, like, Raphael just ends that whole mob thread. Yep. He just <laughs> just confronts him in his, uh, in his house. Yeah. <laughs> with, the, with the surviving Foot Clan members. And then Tells we're them moving to on. Back the hell Good. off, and I guess he does. Well, they're scared of Shredder, is what's so funny. Like, they don't realize that's not Shredder. That's true, they don't. So, it's just kind of interesting it, that basically, a, like, the even in death, like, Shredder's got that kind of, like... Oh, th- now I remember the whole situation. The mob paid the Foot Clan to kidnap... Shadow. Yeah. And then... They broke the I guess agreement. Michelangelo rescued her. And then Raph was supposed to assassinate somebody, but didn't. I don't know. It's been a while. It's been too long. It'll it's be fine. It's been too long. <laughs> moving on. Moving on. But but I, I found it funny just because Raph says he's going to give this guy his money back for paying the foot to kidnap the girl. Just as right. a way to balance things. Uh, but yeah. He's just trying to make peace. He's just trying to end this shit. Like, the, the the Mafia and the Foot Clan have both just been, like, pains in everyone's ass for this whole series. So basically, it's just, like, Raph kind of just, like, forces a peace treaty here. And then but, we hear, we see uh, that Splinter is still nuts. He's yeah. nutso in the brain. But he is, uh, he is, uh, in the astral plane... And he runs into the ghost form of Donnie, who uh, is naked for some (laughs) reason. Uh, And Donnie doesn't really know what's going on because he's stuck in this limbo and he's trying to get help from Splinter. But Splinter's a monster and does not want to help. But we do briefly. He's out of his mind, even in the astral plane. Like, he's out of his mind. But, uh,. Which comes up later. So. It does. Yeah. But uh, he gets... Splinter, Bat Splinter gets caught by, I guess, uh, uh, I'd say police, police officer. Which yeah, gets, the police uh, are trying to track him down. And mm-hmm. then, like, basically, Raph's like, whoa, hey, there's Splinter. Let's... Hey, Foot Clan, let's go get Splinter. And, of course, Splinter, you know, is crazy but knows and hates Shredder. Like, even if he's crazy, he hates Shredder. Yep. And so... <laughs> he he, you know, beats the shit out of what he thinks is Shredder, but then Raph's like, "Dude, it's me, Master Splinter." And then it's like, <laughs> and that doesn't help Bra. because he remembers Donnie in his dreams and stabs him anyway. Yeah, as a turtle, because he thinks demon. the turtles are demons. Yep, he's a turtle demon. So, yep. And that's that. That is another that. another pulse pounding issue, which brings us to fifteen. Oh, dude. I love this cover, uh, even though it's kind of like, it is, to me, funny that the radiator's blasting steam the way it is. Yeah. I do love is, this cover. Why is that funny? I don't know. I know that it what wouldn't find so funny life. about that? What's so funny about radiators? 
<laughs> it's just a funny visual of the steam, that's all. Yeah, I think it's cool. I like it. Yeah, well, I like it a lot. I think it's better Gone than the in the back to tank. Better than the original no. cover. Yeah, the original cover had like the carrot spikes. Yeah. Coming out of uh, Donatello, Cyborg Donatello. The the Kevin Eastman cover is not that great on this one. It's just yeah. Mikey petting the cat. Yeah, he phoned it in. He looked at the first page. <laughs> he, this that was a, this is a weird kind of subplot now that's happening with Mikey like becoming the writer. Was that something that was in the original? Well, Mikey was always someone who wanted to be more out in the outside world, and through his writing, yeah. he gets to do that because he can't he can't be out because he's a turtle. Was that? Was that established in like the uh, I don't, series I, before this I, that he was more I don't, into writing? So. I don't recall. Yeah, I just he was always kind of pining for being in human society. So I agree. Why. Yeah, I think that was kind of his thing. I do love all the heavy black inks on these pages. Yeah, it's awesome. Like a, uh, it's cool the little like chamber set up in there. Like an entire wall of like a suspension chamber for Donatello. Yeah. I guess Vanguard hooked him up. Yeah, very strange. Leo eating a banana is hilarious. Just a funny visual. (laughs) I think it's funny. I didn't... They go into the astral plane a lot. Well, Leonardo does that. He's the spiritual one. I just didn't know that the turtles were so into it. I like it. You never saw the first movie? No, no, I remember that, bro. <laughs> of course, that was clutch. But I'm just saying it's funny because, man, they go into the astral plane a lot. Like a good bit in this. Yeah, the turtle, yeah. Turtle, turtles have always played around a bit with mysticism. So, I mean, it's not the you know primary thing, but Splinter's always been into it. And Leo takes after Splinter. and It's cool. They I'm fought their it. share of supernatural beings. I mean, Shredder keeps coming back as like parasitic worms because of magic. Yeah. Those are some great issues. When they had all, like, back in the Mirage time yeah. with those issues where, like, the different types of shredders that were all pas- parasitic worms. Those were some of my first Ninja Turtle comics. Those things were awesome. Anyway, we find out that Sh- uh, Shredder Raph has been kind of out for, like, a week, right? Or so? Oh, right. Ever yeah. since the end of last issue because the cliffhanger happens and then it kind of cut to this. His old pitchfork stab and got him. Yeah, somehow, so, so somehow, okay. somehow they've captured Splinter in a cage, right? And dra- drug uh, Raf back to ha- headquarters. And so they're all messing around in the astral plane, and something jacked up happens. So Raf's with with the Foot Clan, and no one knows that Raf's the where he is. Right, right. No one knows he's a Shredder. No one knows where he is. Uh, no one knows that Donatello is alive and floating in the astral plane, like lost in the astral plane. Right. right. Mikey doesn't want anything and to do with the astral plane, so he's not there. So he's not in it. Right. So Leo ventures in and he finds Raph and Donatello and Splinter, right? Right. Or no, yes. not yet. They, well, they, he, he, yes, he, they do. Splinter finds uh, Donatello. He's choking the shit out of him. Raph scares <laughs> him off. Uh, Raph and Donnie reunite, and then Leo shows up, and then all hell breaks loose. Yeah, they end up in the the whole wrong body thing is hilarious. Yeah, Leo, <laughs> Leo wait, no, Donnie ends up in Raph's body. Right. Right, yeah, and he is... Confused uh, and doesn't know what the fuck's going confused. on. Very confused. Leo ends up in Raph's, right, or no? Uh, you might be right. I'm trying to find out where they actually says his name. Because I don't know if he does. Well, nope. The old man, the old, like, the mystical, like, foot. Donnie okay. ends up in... Le- Leo's the first one to leave, so he must be the first one to wake up. So he mu- it must be Leo and Raph. Donnie wakes up in uh, Leo's body. Yep. All right. Yes. So, and that only lasts, it seems like, a few minutes before they all kind of... Yeah. Is that, it, Eventually, it get does re- unscrambled. It, it did seem like a little bit um, quick, like it wasn't no long term ramifications, because they seem to wake up, realize they're in the wrong body, and then pass out again, and then <laughs> yeah, and then switch back. A, 
it's a good kind of story device to get them to realize where everybody is. Yeah, basically that's all it does is Leo knows where Raph's body is. And everyone knows Donnie and, is still alive in the astral plane. And Raph, they think, is captured by the foot. Right. And maybe Shredder is still alive. Possibly, still. yes. And then, like, Leo and Donnie freaks out and throws the, the radiator into, like, the glass to get his body back. Oh, yeah, Donnie's still right. in Leonardo after this point. And so he's freaking out because his body is in the, in the, in the tank. And so he chucks a radiator at the tank because that's a logical thing to do. <laughs> yeah, that's what a technology guy would think to do. He does, he does <laughs> machines, you know. And then they all kind of, after that happens, he kind of passes out, wakes up, everyone's back in their bodies. And then the big reveal is that Donatello's back in his body he seems to have full control of the robotics now. The the CPU, which I think is funny. Don't they have to have like a footnote to like spell out CPU for you? Yeah, yeah there's, funny... there, there's a <laughs> bunch have... of those things that are yeah, like CPR, CPU. Wait, wait, NRA. Wait, all right, yeah, dude, later you on, don't got to tell us. Later on, the, the NRA shows up and they yeah. tell you what NRA stands for. Yeah, yeah, it's like I think we're okay. We don't we don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it looks like though that donatello can like control the cybernetics and he actually like they're surprised because they think he'll never walk because the the you think they think the robot part is destroyed and therefore he can't control it but he does and he's actually like bigger than the other turtles now yeah yeah he mentions vaguely for a moment having trouble getting around like he says something like it's more clunky Without the AI helping, but basically he gets the hang of it in like so no time. He basically gets the best of both worlds because now he gets to be the techno guy and be in control <laughs> and not be right, dead. Right, 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 right. Which uh, <laughs> is convenient. I I, 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 much, I do have to say yeah. it's a little it was a little convenient them all going back in their bodies properly, and then Donnie yeah. and Donnie getting back into his body after being dead. Remember that the um, mystical foot ninja dude was trying to get the right soul in the right body. Yeah, yeah. So I guess they was, had that. I guess it was they had that going his doing. Him. Yeah, yeah. They had that going for him. Yeah, and that basically concludes this issue. Yep, I'm just it, killing it, him, dude. Issue fifteen. Yep, it, it ends with uh, Leonardo saying, "Let's go get Shredder." Who they Let's don't go kick some astral who plane, they dude? Don't, who they don't know is actually Raphael. You get a nice little uh, fake out here. I think that the uh, Kevin Eastman cover is pretty sweet on this one. Yeah, so for the listeners who might not see it, the Kevin Eastman cover. So in this issue, they all disguise themselves as like Shredder's elite guard yep. to try to infiltrate and attack Shredder. Who they don't know is actually Raphael. They think they're going to save Raphael. It's a merry mix-up. We'll get to that. So, so Eastman's cover has got all the turtles on the cover. It's got Shredder, Raphael, and then the three brothers in the Elite Guard costumes, which is kind of neat. I like that. And I actually like Fosco's new cover better than the original. It's one of the few new ones that I like better. With uh... um, I mean, I like them both, but I like Fosco's take on like the astral plane and the bat shredder that looks like he's going out of his mind. Yeah. Like I right. thought that he did a really it good job on this cover. It is interesting, because if you think about it, um, Fosco didn't draw the astral plane stuff in color in mind. Right. So like, the color colorist must have come up with the whole blue kind of smoky looking thing. And so Fosco has done his version of it after the fact. Yeah. Well, I did want to say that like uh, he would have at the very least like, you know, Fosco indicated the whole smoke thing because some of the panel layouts I wanted to note were really cool on that whole astral plane sequence in the last issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the little smoky, wispy thing was at least uh, visually implied in the old issues. Yeah, it was like thinner lines, too, in the old issues. But okay. it was very cool that he like gave it its own whole, like, every time they're in there, it's blue. Like, you instantly know where they are. And the panels are, yeah. like, off-kilter. Right. They're not... They're yeah, not, they're all wavy. Yeah. This, cool little visual cues. This is a nice little fake out there here for just a moment, like, where you think it's Shredder Raff behind him. And then you flip the page, and it's just like Cyberdon 
And he's like, you know, kind of got like his own little mock shredder armor. Yeah, great job coloring too, real crisp. I love the zipatone type stuff in the background on the first page. Oh yeah, with the cloud. Yeah, that is neat. Yeah, the faded kind of uh, cyber Donny. I don't know. It's good. Looks good. It's good. Yeah. Dark. The blacks look great. See, good yeah. Stuff. Here's the man. This armor is hard to control. Yeah. So he's just a little nod that, like you know, the AI is gone. But this is where they decide to infiltrate this dirty movie theater where the turtles watched porn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they say that, don't they? Yes. Yep. He says where we used to watch porno flicks. That's a little weird. Well, they are. They are. They are human infused. Like, it just sounded a little weird. They're they kids. Are, they are turtle boys. <laughs> but uh, it's cool, man. I like it. They like they jump the elite front <coughs> guard and like you know take their outfits. I love um, the scene of Shredder Raff on the throne. He kind of looks like King Conan on the throne. Yep, yep, I get just that. Sitting there with his arm, and he's got the splinter. What bat in the little cage? It was very much like Golem. <laughs> yeah, and Cyberdon is able to like morph his appearance. Yeah, which is cool, <laughs> and seems new. <laughs> yeah, now that he's got control of the powers, he's pretty much using it differently. Love seeing the turtles dressed up in like those little ninja kind of yep. costumes, just kicking butt. I thought the scene was hilarious where Leo's fighting Shredder, Raph, and you know they both don't know who each other are because they're both in costume. And then when Raph figures it out, he just starts laughing. That's great. Yeah, they get it. Like I said, the whole merry mix up. Like they're you know just yep. ready to kick each other's ass for like two seconds, and then he's like. I love like the katana blade just stuck in the the shredder kind of gauntlet things. Looks pretty cool. That's a that's a cool touch. Where? Uh, the scene where he's laughing and it's just kind of like Leo's blades are kind of stuck in the shredders, like arm gauntlets. Mm-mm-mm. Oh, yeah, the ha-ha-ha, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's awesome. It's good stuff, dude. This uh, this sequence is cool. The little mystical dude sort of catches him up to speed on what's going on, you know. He's like, here's Splinter, he's out of his fucking mind, like, you know, he's nuts. So, you guys gotta go in there and try and, like, get him back in his right mind. So, they all... Time to ast- more adventures in the astral plane. Donnie does not want to go because he's had his own problems there. He's uh, right. he's not a fan, but he eventually comes around. They're a family. <laughs> yeah, so they're in there and they're just sort of whooping the shit out of Splinter, having a fight or whatever. Just sort of cruises along. Raph gets a better of him, and then like you know when Raph for whatever happens, like when Raph like kills him, like basically that sort of brings Splinter around. Yeah, it is a little confusing because. They tell you that if you die in the game, you die in real life, and then right. then uh, Raph just stabs Splinter, and apparently that helps turn him back into a rat, or at least turns his mind back into a rat, which is uh, good. I'm not a, I wasn't a big fan of the bat. I actually kind of mm-hmm. thought I I thought the bat thing stayed around the whole series, but I guess yeah. Uh, no, yeah. it did not because. Uh, I liked it. I think it made Splinter more active and involved and more interesting than if he'd just been, like, the grandfatherly type. Like, we've seen that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was neat. I thought it was neat. Also, shout-outs to Gary for having a Ninja Turtle call Splinter Master Sphincter. What? (laughs) That is pretty dope. (laughs) Master Sphincter. What are you talking about? Uh, he makes fun of Master Splinter and calls him Master Sphincter. When? Yeah. Where? Um, oh, oh, when he gets stabbed. Okay, yeah, I got yeah, it. Yeah. So, so that kind of, that, that issue ends with them kind of killing the bat in the astral plane and holding Splinter. So we're like, oh, is this, is this the end of Splinter, right? Right, yeah, yeah. He's like, Leo, Mike, anybody help? 
And that kind of concludes 16. Yep. Rolling right along. 17, A Hunting We Will Go. Cool. I like the new cover a lot. Yeah, I do too. I like uh, Leo in the kind of in the shadows. The old cover is a little funny. The Larson one with Fosco. Well, I guess it's Fosco with Larson Inks. It's like picking up the little baby alligator. Meanwhile, like... <laughs> Leatherhead is behind him. <laughs> is it Leatherhead or Leatherface? Le- 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 leatherhead, yeah. This I guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> I was also, the whole time, see, I'm not really familiar with Mirage Comics Leatherhead. Yeah, he, 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 is, not, the cartoon. he is not that. So yeah, I was going to say, the whole time I was reading this, I was thinking, oh, guarantee. <laughs> this I guarantee. <laughs> leatherhead was such a cool toy. <laughs> he really was because the top of his head was like on a, a pivot so you could just sort of like do the alligator chomp oh it's so good mm. I love the way that 17 opens up because you're like oh fuck Splinter bit it yeah, yeah it, it is. this is a, That's this a, is a great terrible splash. terrible trick it's great though I love that yeah I love it too I still can't believe it and then they're like <laughs> oh, they're just looking at the mausoleum of their little like got infiltrated or they think it is yeah he just can't believe someone burglarized their headquarters <laughs> but yeah i, I bought the funny it. thing is though you still don't know if splinter's dead or not right yeah because i it, bought it, it hook it, line it, and sinker though it was, was like, kind oh. of a it was kind of a hard cut to this from the end of the last issue but that's good yeah. dude that's good comics it is i was like oh splinter's fucking dead what <laughs> and you believe it because it's like so much shit has happened already in this series that like I mean, if you told me that he was dead, I, you know, I totally I believe. Totally, it. yeah. <laughs> I, I think no, gonna... he doesn't die until issue twelve of the next series. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Spoilers. Is that real? Yeah, that's real. I told you they're middle-aged men, middle-aged turtles. Then Splinter got old, finally died. Lame. In fact, I found this. That was the whole. Yeah, that was the whole thing about that series is that Splinter. The whole premise kind of was it led up to Splinter dying, and then after Splinter died, the four turtles all kind of went their own directions for a while. No, oh. and then the series ended before they kind of came back together, which was kind of an important part that they really should have got to. Right. But it was good. I love that series. I hope they reprint that next. To be honest, because it. I... I will say that when I very first read this, I could not have possibly guessed how important these damn rabbits setting that alarm off would be. Oh, yeah. I had no idea. I was like, oh, this little, I just thought it was like a little ha-ha anecdote. No, those rabbits setting that alarm off really fucked shit up the rest of the sequence here. It's people oh. ignoring the alarm left and right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a great... Um, sequence or, or scene between Leo and Rat, which is pretty crazy. Like, you know, I thought after that last issue, okay, like this whole Shredder thing's done now, but he's holding on to it and going to stay leader of the Foot Clan. The, the relationship between Raf and Leo has always been the best part about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Because mm-hmm. Leo's the leader, but Raph thinks he wants to be the leader. But he's not very, he's not typically very good at it. Yeah. But this is really his first opportunity to be a leader of something. So not, clear- not liking taking orders doesn't make you a good leader. Right. So this is kind of him achieving his dream of becoming a leader. So whether or not it works out for him, that's what's kind of driving him right now. Right. Like, uh, yeah. But it's a good sequence, like him literally slamming the door between them. <laughs> like... You know, figuratively and literally, like putting up a, a wall between them. It's good stuff. Yeah, because Leo can't be around because Leo, Leo's personality doesn't allow him to not lead, and so he would only undermine Raph's leadership. So he can't be around. Uh, and what's the, funny the is clan. even he, even he agrees. Right. He's like, nah, Raph's right. There can't be two leaders, and I'm a leader, not a follower. I was like, oh yeah, all right, cool. I think it was cool that, like, you were saying, like, the Shredder thing didn't go away real quick. I- I'll say that, like, I think something cool Gary did on this was that, like, he didn't just, like, magic away these things. Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah, he just sort of let things ride, you know? 
No, I love the fact that we're seeing like Raph continue on as a leader of the foot. Now, this dude that took these photos says issue 12, remember question mark. I don't remember. <laughs> what are you talking about? So the little dude that's narking uh narking the Ninja Turtles out to like the uh, men in black. Yeah, I think he was just kind of in the shadows or something just snapping pictures at the mausoleum yeah and they do seem to be concerned about aliens specifically so i don't think these guys are related to the people we're about to see later i think this no but I... okay sorry i didn't mean to which is on. i think was intended basically we're gonna run into a bunch of people in the sewers with guns and stuff well so those I... people were there for a bounty right yeah like a bounty a ten thousand dollar bounty was put on the head of a uh whoever could bring a giant lizard monster that like a the child of some people, right? So those hunters are not related to the men in black at all, right? But I I think we're meant to think they are until we realize they're not. Oh yeah, I think you're right. Yep. Yeah, the men in black. I think with this everything with this death watch and everything that these guys are like on patrol for aliens and stuff. Yep. And, and the turtles the, have had dealings with aliens before. Triceratons. The thing I find funny, it's kind of ridiculous, like, a bunch of guys with guns in the sewers like that would ever be able to be done. In it's New not, York. You're not in the woods, yeah, you're in the sewers, and a bunch of guys with shotguns walking around the city, blasting things. A little little ridiculous, but comics. I love it. I like that panel big time of uh, Leo coming out of the sewers. Like, he's got the manhole over his uh, head, and, like, the hunters are just silhouettes in the distance. That's a really yeah. good panel. Yep. And then the damn rabbits. Goddamn rabbits. <laughs> what is it? Like, it's, it look, and again, it's kind of funny. Like I said, there's just hats off to Gary for juggling all this shit. But, like, him slipping down the thing, it could have just been he slipped down the balcony because of bloody hands or something. Right. Nah, Casey set a trap for the mob. Well, that makes sense. (laughs) With Vaseline. I'm just saying, it's a nice touch. A nice little extra. And I guess apparently that's where Splinter's been kind of resting up, right? Or no? Yes. Splinter, yes. Yeah. Correct. Splinter and Mikey have been living here. Yes. Who else reads Comic Splinter's dialogue in the voice of the movie? Oh, a little bit. <laughs> yes, the cure was perhaps as painful as what ailed me. Was it not? I was just resting my eyes, Leonardo. Actual sleep is very rare, indeed. <laughs> I can't help it, dude. Like, yeah. And then they eat pizza. <laughs> and then like you're talking about like dark shit like these hunters like, oh yeah mu- they get hard mutil- <laughs> these mutilated hunters yeah it's pretty gross it's grizzly dude a trail of mutilated hunters i love it you know i'm i'm not as a, a big a fan of this part of this this is probably this in the next issue which we'll talk about probably my least favorite so far of the series i feel like uh, this stuff's getting a little shoehorned in really but yeah, the leatherhead and I like this you know, if only because it ties in some stuff from the previous series. Yeah, that's true. It, it you know tell it, we get a little flashback here of stuff that happened in the previous series with the uh, utans and the and leatherhead's whole deal. The cranes, now the komodo guys are back. Well, that I mean, you weren't a fan of the komodo guys to begin with, right? I think. I, I I think it was more Raven. You weren't, yeah, right? and I'm still not. But actually, that's why I kind of like King Komodo here, right? Because a King Komodo is cool as a name, yeah. But b King Komodo is kind of like makes that whole out of everything that happened in this whole run. I've liked that the least. I still don't like that part as much as the other parts. But it's mm-hmm. kind of cool for me. This was a little bit of redemption for the King Komodo stuff. I mean, for the Komodo, like, warlord guy. Yeah. Because this, like, gave birth to this King Komodo character, who I think is pretty cool. Okay. So, for me, I actually, like, I love this King Komodo stuff because it made the 
previous Komodo thing kind of mean more. Yeah. So I'm into it. I I like it. I mean, you know, Leatherhead, whatever, but because he's just not as cool as he is in the cartoon. <laughs> oh, he's a big crocodile. <laughs> just, big, it's kind of funny. But he's the big fake out. You know, you got to think that it's Leatherhead that's eating all these people and stuff and you get the old switcheroo. I appreciate Gary. The thing is, I appreciate Gary doing the fake out. Yeah. Like, no, absolutely. That, that was what I liked. Like I, cause again, I was totally thinking that they were just going to go down there and beat up on Leatherhead for a minute, but no King Komodo total surprise. Like it totally surprised me. I had, I did not see that shit coming at all. And King Komodo kind of has a cool power, like the whole mind control thing. Which we'll get into in the next issue. Yeah, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Issue issue 18, issue which is the last issue for us for now. For now. Yeah. Um, so, right away, word balloons on the cover are awesome. Yeah, this yeah lettering I agree. is awesome. I agree. Fight it, Leatherhead. <laughs> it's good. <clears throat> Excuse me. So right away we get into a Leonardo versus the regular Komodo dragons. So, and this is pretty sweet. Yeah, l- l- once again we get a one guy versus an army sort of situation. And we see Leo really show his stuff. Yeah, he's a pretty, badass, Which dude. is pretty impressive. He's fl- flipping giant Komodo dragons it, it's and not breaks 40, one's It's not 49 neck. dudes, but you know, he, he, you know he, he's hurt. He also didn't need a Tommy gun, so how about that? Yeah, true. <laughs> Put his katana blade right down the throat of one of those dragons. Well, awesome. that that whole sequence is really freaking weird because it really looks like it bit his... Like, how did the Komodo dragon, like, get the whole thing down his throat to begin with? And then bite his arm. And then not also, like, rip his arm off. I don't know. Well, I don't know. It bit around his arm, but then it died instantly when the sword went right through. Yeah, but it must not have bit very hard because in the very next scene there's like no blood on his wrist. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's uh, just a little awkward, I'd say. Here we see Casey clowning Mikey for his story. Yeah, it's a... Casey is... Yeah, but you you guys missed something before that. Oh shit. Take us back. Where uh, King Komodo basically chomps on yeah, Leo's hand. Yeah. And that's the scene where we'll see next, but that's where his hand gets taken off. Right, and Jim, I think huge. I think that was the fake out. Is that like you kind of like have that one Komodo dragon bite his arm and like he is okay? Yep. <laughs> and then so when King Komodo goes and bites his arm this time, it's just like, eh, you know, he'll be okay. Is what you're thinking? Right. But, yeah. But he read his his little like inner dialogue he's like it doesn't work and I pass out screaming bloody murder yeah that's great that's a great transition and you're like whoa and again this weird like Raph and Mike like you saying the Michelangelo type in his little story writing a love story loser what do you love love <laughs> 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 No, it's a horror story. Anyway, bro, let's go. Let's go, dude. They're just ignoring the alarm. Like, ignoring the alarm left and right. Like, we heard the alarm go off during Leo's last sequence, and here we see them ignoring the alarm again, because they think it's the rabbits. So, again, I I love how that one tiny little thing wound up being such like a... (laughs) Such an element. (laughs) So, it's a recurring gag, really. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Leo wakes up and King Komodo has bitten his fucking hand off. <laughs> what a, what a, what a jerk. And what? here he sort of explains that he was, uh, the Komodo dragon that, that the Komodo had there. Right. You know? the, 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 the giant one. Right. And then even though he got blasted. So this weird kind of thing, it's like he, he escaped and got tortured by Pimico and now he's doing... No, tutored, right? Tutored, Yes. Oh, well, learn to read Raven. That's a big difference there. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was like, why would he be helping her? Well, th- that's one of the things I didn't like. It seems a little, like, shoehorned in. Well, I I mean, a lot of time has passed since that first arc. 
like couple weeks. Yeah. Because the the whole Death Watch thing actually took weeks, uh, or at least that's what I thought the uh, the uh, narration said. Um, also, didn't uh, King Komodo get into a fight with Mako? Like during the escape. We would have to flip back. I'd have to go back I and check. I think so. I think you're right. But uh, but yeah, basically he's been mutated like the turtles into a humanoid Komodo dragon. Right. Which which is the whole like appeal of Ninja Turtles, in my opinion, is all these mutated animals. Right. And so he's got to make those action figures. He's basically he's basically taken over. Well, he in, I think he intends to take over the role of the warlord, or at least similar. Right I'm, now, he just wants revenge. I'm low key okay with the Pimico connection because you gotta think that Pimico doesn't really have the foot anymore, right? And so, and she hates the turtles. She does. And so, it kind of makes sense that she would use this guy to try and take them out. Because remember, there were four Komodo dragons, so it makes sense that like, you know, they'd be pretty good match for the four Ninja Turtles, except. She just fucking underestimated how badass Leonardo is. But then we get to see his weirdo mind powers, and he fucking sort of controls Leatherhead a little yeah, bit. Yep, um, Leo frees Leatherhead to have an extra ally, but it just backfires on him when the Komodo dragon tells him that, oh, I can just control the minds of lizards. Watch this. <laughs> so uh, Leo gets basically... Cr- uh, Jumped by Leatherhead and dunked in the water. And here we get to see the dick move of them all. Yeah. Raph smashing the beeper. Yeah, he, he basically tells them. This almost seems like a test of the foot because uh, the Foot Clan guy says, Master your alarm, shall we investigate? And Raph says, No, it no longer concerns me, and then smashes it. Uh, so it seems like. It almost seems like a test. If not a, uh, uh, just because if 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 Raph had shown concern, I feel like the foot would have turned on him. Just just as an opinion, I feel like it just is Raph kind of fallen further away from his brothers and more into this Shredder role. Right. Yeah. Because like, what a dick. <laughs> He's like faulty alarm in the cemetery is not my problem. Crush. Wow. My place is no longer with them. It's with you, the Foot Clan. <laughs> yeah, he's a dick, dude. I don't know. I, I think he's playing a role, to be honest. I think he's out of his depth. He's trying to be a, be a badass. We'll see. But we get a mysterious stranger in the, in the, in the, in the shadows. So these guys... With Shredder's elite guard. Yeah, so the guys in the hats are Shredder's elite guards. Right. So the interesting thing is, it it was very briefly mentioned. Um, the previous issue, when the turtles infiltrated the uh, the headquarters, when they took out the two elite guards that were standing outside, mm-hmm. apparently the foot didn't know they were there. They right. weren't guards. They were actually from whoever this is. Right. Keeping an eye on the foot. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when uh, the turtles took their costumes, the foot was very confused why they were there at all. Well, the, exactly. the elite guard it mentioned were loyal to Shredder, not even the Foot Clan. Right, and they had been wiped out previously, so no one really knew why they were there. Right. And, and so, so we clearly see there are still some kicking around, and if they're loyal to Shredder, then who's this person in the shadows? Right, it's Pimico. Hint, it's Pimico. <laughs> it's Pimico, we know for sure. Although, it may not be Pimico. Um, I think we're mixing something up here. Pimico was the assassin that worked for the Warlord, yes? I thought she was Shredder's first, daughter. Yeah. Shredder has a daughter. I forget what her name is off the top of my head. She Pimico. she comes and goes. Wait, was it? That's my understanding. Uh, so wasn't Pim- so Pim is Craig? Are you thinking Pimico is Shredder's daughter? Yeah, that's what I thought too. Hold on. I don't remember. It's cause, been a while. Because her, her but name, I'm pretty her certain. name, uh, Shredder's daughter's name is uh, uh, Kari, and. Yeah, but was that just, is this just, was written out, right? This isn't canon anymore? No, it is canon, or at least it should be. Um, I don't think the image stuff is canon anymore. No, it, that's the whole point of it getting an ending, is that it is canon to the Mirage series. Uh, 
how do you spell her name? Pim? P-I-M-I-K-O. I-K-O. Is the possible... So I'm looking up the Turtlepedia. That's what I'm on. Pimiko appears in Image Comics and is the possible daughter of Arukusaki. Oh, okay. And former leader of Go Komodo's hired Kanuchi. All right. I guess uh, they're both his daughter. Okay. Told you, bro. <laughs> bruh, bruh, bruh. Radical, bro. Anyway. She's his daughter. So Mikey and Casey show up in the sewers, and they basically follow the same breadcrumb trail, leading them to Leatherhead. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, of course, brings them up to King uh, Komodo, watching Leo and Leatherhead wrestle in the sewer water. And then the funniest thing of all is for Leo to get the best of Leatherhead and make his way up, only to have King Komodo pointing a gun. <laughs> it's like, it's he, must like, have, he must have took it from one of the the hunters, which is a really funny thing. Oh, I've been meaning to try one of these things out. It's like, dude, that's just so funny and weird. He's just going to fucking shoot him after all. <laughs> but Mikey and Casey to the rescue. Yep. With with a with a whack to the back of his head seems a little uh, easy. They give old King Komodo the old uh, double tap, the old level love tap, vanilla nut tap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we see the minute the MIB uh, ambush Donnie in the uh, cemetery HQ. Yep, Donnie returns to the headquarters, and whoever these men in black guys are, they surround him. I'm very disappointed that we didn't get to see his trip to Pittsburgh. I was super hoping we would. Yeah, I mean, it does. I was like, I was like, cool. Oh, he's not. All right. Oh, yeah, denied. <laughs> Why did he go to Pittsburgh? I don't remember. And it was he like says, an issue ago. He, he clearly says he's like, do you? It, like he asks, he's like, do you want to go to Pittsburgh? And everybody's like, nah. I'm trying to remember <laughs> like, what happened in Pittsburgh. It's like, do you want to go to Pittsburgh? Nah. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, for whatever reason, Donnie was gone to Pittsburgh and comes back and, like, he gets ambushed by the MIB. I'm trying to see right now. Do you want to go to Pittsburgh? He said... Doesn't say why. No, he doesn't say... Yeah, he doesn't say why. He just wants to go to Pittsburgh. Weird. Huh. Yeah, weird. Must have won a pierogi. All right. Well, at any rate... So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much the end of the issue. Yeah, then it's cover next issue has got the, what do you call those aliens? The Triceratop aliens? Triceratons. They are awesome. Yeah. They are awesome. And the little crane guy. Yeah, dude. Which would have been a big deal for readers in that time, because they've been gone a while. Who? The Triceratons. Oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're a popular, uh, um, group because they They're have right. very Did they, good design. The weird thing is, I feel like the the toys never really. Did they ever make a figure? They of that? did. Ah, they must have. They made one. It, it took them a while, probably, because yeah. I don't remember it. Yeah, they made a Triceraton. Thing is, with the cartoons, I can't remember like how big of a role the Triceratons had in the show. Uh, they had a much larger role in the comics. I was going to say it was yeah. it was dramatically reduced. Like it was nowhere near as important. Cuz there was like whole like off-world alien world adventures. Yeah, they like battled in the alien arena, right? right? Yep. You're remembering yeah, remember correct. That. So what do you guys still think about mm-hmm. turtles, especially specifically these uh six issues? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah, six. Dude, I'm into it. Like I I'm really on board. Like Yeah. I it's fun. I mean, I any listeners out there that are, are made it this far and without buying this is crazy but uh if you haven't been buying i mean it, it really much re- very much reads like yeah savage dragon it, it, reads it's definitely in, in an era and if you're a fan at all of like like well dragon number one but like freak force or super patriot mm-hmm. you really owe it to yourself to read this comic just yeah to, you really especially do. if you've never read it because oh because yeah. it, it is like getting a taste of that era now I totally agree as someone who never read this stuff like absolutely it's like getting more savage dragon like it really more is more classic savage dragon yeah yeah absolutely more that four plot lines more, at once not savage even dragon. just savage dragon although it is heavily influenced you know 
stylistically by Eric Larson. It's really more of that mid '90s sort of superhero that you just you don't see much of anymore. Correct, because it's not the '90s. <laughs> yeah, I did want to throw one thing out, just a real quick aside. So, um, if you frequent the Savage Dragon Facebook group, uh, which is highly active, I highly recommend that you do. But uh, you'll know that me and Jim went to Terrific Con, where I just Mr. Magooed my way into a bunch of black and white uh, Ninja Turtles issues. If you like, had, if I had been five seconds faster, <laughs> well, let me tell you what, um, quite a find. Um, we, I'd never seen these, and uh, I just wanted to say, uh, as somebody who was exposed to the color versions first. And then went back and read these black and white issues. Now, um, I really enjoy how this looks in black and white. Uh, I want to echo again, I had said before I'd even seen these things, that I would love to see this re- this whole thing recollected in black and white. Um, absolutely. But let me also throw out that if you're the kind of guy that likes to hunt down back issues, uh, an extra really nice treat uh, aside from the fact that this has all those awesome image era, early image era house ads like uh, Bone, like I'm looking at issue one. There's a there's a ad for Bone. There's an oh, ad you found for, a copy of issue number one? I didn't realize that. Yeah, there's a there's an issue. There's an ad for Bone. There's an ad for Distant Soil. A, there's an ad for Savage Dragon Twenty Nine, and uh, a cool thing is that Eric Larson himself does. He like mans the letters column. And so it's kind of cool to see in these letters columns uh, Eric replying to people and to just sort of see like his grand scheme and his impressions of things that were going on and stuff. Because it's kind of like he talks about their plans, things that we now know, you know, here in modern era that like it never came to fruition. But he was talking about how like the turtles were going to, you know, continue to move in real time the way Savage Dragon does. Mm -hmm. And it kind of helps you when you think about that. It kind of makes these turtle issues make even more sense. Yeah. Because, you know, we've said several times as we're reading these that it feels like, you know, time passes between issues. Yes. And that's exactly what's happening is that, like, you know, it's moving in real time, finger quotes. So uh, it's cool. I like reading the uh, old letters. You see names from Savage Dragon fandom that you know, like Augie, Augie DeBleek, like, you know, you know him from Freak Force. You know him if you're a Savage Dragon guy. Like it's cool seeing those old names. A really awesome nugget is in issue one. Eric does this huge. There's no letters obviously for issue one, so Eric's just talking about basically, you know, turtles and how he knows them and how he related to them. How how does he relate to them? Oh, dude, it's it's awesome. It's just basically the one of the best nuggets out of this little thing is he says that uh, he remembered someone showing him the comic, like Ninja Turtles number one. Yeah. And he says, and this is a quote, he goes, I remember writing to Mike and telling him that, while I thought the comic was cool, I didn't think the creator should continue it. We all get the joke. What more needs to be said? <laughs> ah. <laughs> they showed me is the next line. So, basically it's funny, you know, just to see his, and he gives a, kind of like a history, like there's stuff... In his little thing where he's talking about, like, uh, things you may not, like, sort of weird connections for Ninja Turtles. Like, basically, we all know the story of, like, Eastman and Laird doing the little, like, you know, low-run print. And then, like, with a tax return and a loan from their uncle or something like that. But then, like, he sort of, like, ties it in, like, with a little bit more history than that. So, it's really cool. I, I recommend it highly. If you can track down those old issues, I know they're hard to find, but like they're out there, and I really hope that uh, I I know Jim. You said that like IDW is not real likely to do this. Yeah, but oh I don't, baby, it doesn't seem like their style. I'd love it if they would, because some of this work I think looks just as cool in a completely different way in black and white as it does in color. So. It's cool. I'd love to see that. But at any rate, just want to throw that in real quick. Cool. Yeah. So uh, I guess that's it for this one. Hopefully next episode, well, we got a couple of options for next episode. I'm not sure what we're doing next episode. 
Um, latest news is that uh, Savage Dragon 247 got bumped to mid-December, so hopefully we'll see that before the end of the year. We got a year. We know and can say at least that we got a year in review coming up at some point. That's yeah. We plan to do a year, basically a year in Savage Dragon re- re- retrospective sometime in December. Got a got another uh, retro review in the pipeline. You'll be hearing soon. Uh, covering more. Uh, actually, what does it cover? Covers the Ninja Turtles. Dragon crossover right. from Rush, right? More Ninja Turtles. I forgot. And, back and issue three? Is yes, that, or? yes. The, the the Mirage half of the crossover and issue number three of the ongoing. I'm I'm actually looking forward to that because I could not participate in that one. So oh, I'd yeah. like to hear what you guys had to say. You will get to hear Scott's uh, Craig Olson impression. It's pretty good. Oh, no. I'm just kidding. He doesn't do one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just like, fucking with you. be? But, uh, yep. We'll be uh, getting to that hopefully by the end of the year, and then next year it'll be the year three hundred. I mean, year of two fifty. The Roaring Twenties, dude, isn't that weird? Yeah, it is kind of weird. I thought we'd all be dead by now. We're, well, <laughs> Jesus, it's, it's, the year ain't over yet. All right, here's hoping. Hmm. Bring it together. All right, so thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>